Uh, can I have your attention, please? Nor normally, we would go through lunch uh, and then have it quiet down and have the speakers, but Senator Hagel has another commitment, and he has told us that he has to be out of here at 1.40, and it's 1 o'clock. So I would ask that we, we're going to start uh, with just a few introductions, and then the Senator will give him enough time to speak and enough time to ask questions. So you're going to have to eat and listen at the same time. But I think we can accomplish that. We do that at home every day anyway. So uh, welcome to all of you to New York Law School. Uh, this law school has been in existence for 116 years, and it's one of two independent law schools uh, in New York. The other one is in a different borough called Brooklyn. Uh, we are the only independent law school uh, here in Manhattan. And again, this is the, and you have your programs, the fourth annual Sybil Shanewall Public Interest Lecture. And I must say, it's a lovely crowd that we have today, and I think we're going to we have a wonderful speaker. He's already spoken to students before uh, this lunch here today, and I hear that uh, it was terrific. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to what he has to say. I had the privilege, as many of you did, to know Sidney. He was bright, he was articulate, and he would be proud that these lectures are done to honor uh, his memory. We, of course, owe a great deal of gratitude to Sidney's wife, Sybil, Table number one. It, it, her efforts and her financial support uh, are the driving force uh, behind this program. She is a colleague of mine on the Board of Trustees, and I am the Chairman of the Board of Trustees of New York Law School. She's a proud graduate herself of New York Law School. She's a distinguished lawyer and she is a champion of women's rights, and last year at graduation, or last May at graduation, she was the first female recipient to receive the New York Law School President's Medal of Honor. So Sybil is one of the best. In addition to serving uh, together on the board, we are close friends, and together, we are a committee of two who serve on the art committee for the new law school building. Uh, and with that, I would like to introduce Rick Manassar, who is the dean of the law school, to say a few words. He's been the dean for eight years uh, under his watch. If you know behind, we are in the process of building a new 300,000 square foot law school building. Uh, much has been done. He's a wonderful dean and a wonderful guy to work with. So, Rick, would you make a few remarks, please? Thank you, Arthur. Sydney and Sybil Shanewald, public interest. These are the things that go together that make up this lecture and make up this law school. And so this annual event becomes our way of celebrating the very purposes that all of us have come together to think about law, its role in society, and the way that all of us have an influence on the world that we live in. Now, every day when we meet our students, we have the opportunity to look at the next generation of leaders in the country. And we know that as we look at them, we can see the future being written in their behavior, in their attitude, in the way they think about the public issues of the day. And it's up for grabs, right? It's up for grabs every day as to what that future will bring us. Is the primary focus of every student that we have or every person who's engaged in the legal educational mission about commerce, about making a good living? If it's not about commerce to making a good living, to the sole purpose, is it about how that can come together with the public interest to do things that are for justice and for the rule of law. And so as teachers, as colleagues, my colleagues who are on this faculty, we come together to ask that question every day as we move to our classroom. But we have to look for our inspiration, not just to each other, but to those who are in the public world around us. This lecture series, in Sydney's honor, 
fueled by Sybil's passion, gives us an annual opportunity to understand that public service and the public interest go together, and that the activities of those who are in the public eye can be guides to us about the way we want to conduct our behavior. We're privileged today to have Senator Hagel with us. We're privileged to have Sybil's guiding hand, and we're privileged to have the friendship of those that she has brought to us as role models for our students, for our faculty, and for all of you in this room. The public interest demands that all of us are attentive to the things that are in the public's interest. And this lecture is our way of making a small contribution to where that inspiration will come. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Sybil Shanewald, whose guidance helps us in this pursuit. Thank you all for coming. Uh, Sidney would love to be here. This is just the kind of gathering that he would have liked, and certainly hearing Senator Hagel talk to the students, he would have been thrilled. Uh, I am, my purpose is to introduce Kenneth Feinberg. Uh, the first, um, can't hear it? Okay. Kenneth R. Feinberg was the first Sidney Shanewell public interest lecturer. His talk was on the 9-11 fund, which only this unique re Renaissance man could have done. He is a man of many talents, great intelligence, integrity, imagination, warmth, humor, and kindness. A man Sidney respected and admired, and with good reason. Basically, Ken is a master mediator, a master music lover and patron, president of the Washington National Opera, master teacher, master family man, and master friend. He is the nation's leading expert on mediation, and most people would agree that he invented that area of the law. He is also the best Rolodex in the universe. <laughs> I'm going to skip over some of his many accomplishments and just say that in the mid-1980s, Judge Weinstein, who we're fortunate to have with us today, was handling thousands of Agent Orange cases brought by Vietnam veterans. Senator Hagel, of course, is a Vietnam veteran. Judge Weinstein consolidated all of those cases into one class action Extending the practice of consolidation to civil litigation was new, and basically Judge Weinstein initiated the era of mass tort litigation. In February 1984, Judge Weinstein had the good judgment to appoint Kenneth Feinberg as the special master to settle all of the Agent Orange cases, and settle he did. He accomplished his mission, and from that time on, Ken Feinberg's life was changed. Ken did much more, more mediation and launched his own firm in 1992 devoted to resol resolving complex litigation. He became a settlement guru who negotiated settlements for, such vict for victims of such varied products as asbestos, the Dalkin Shield, DES, heart valves, breast implants, as well as for victims of securities fraud and environmental exposure. I neglected to say that both uh, Ken Feinberg and Judge Weinstein um, were um, law clerks to one of the most prominent jurists of, in, United, in New York, and that was uh, Judge uh, Stanley Fold. And every year, the Fold, if I recall correctly, the Fold alumni would meet. And uh, the New York Bar is really composed of the elite, the elite of the New York Bar, composed, composed of the Fold alumni. Um, Ken and Judge Weinstein attended uh, annual meetings 
and Ken wondered whether he, like Judge Weinstein, would ever leave his own mark on the law or have an impact on society. We all know that he has had a great impact, not only on the law, but more importantly, on the lives of the people he has helped. Ken Feinberg's book is called What is Life Worth? I would say that his life, his commitment to ideals and ideas, his intellect, his effectiveness, his charm, his forging of a new a uh, area of the law makes his life invaluable to all of us. It is a great privilege and a great honor to introduce Kenneth Feinberg. I had a cut while I was doing I want to thank Sybil. You know, she mentioned my book, What Is Life Worth? Now, if you go to Barnes & Noble and you have trouble finding that book in paperback, my supply of my book is virtually inexhaustible. All you have to do is email me. Um, I just want to uh, very quickly um, thank Sybil. I'm really introducing Senator Hagel for three reasons. First, Sybil asked me to. And as you know, when Sybil asks you to do something, you do it. Arthur Abbey said that Sidney was bright and articulate. And he was. He was. But Sidney's greatest strength was his ability to keep Sybil in check. <laughs> Sybil is a force of nature. And um, when Sybil asked me to do this, of course I said I'd do it. The second reason I'm introducing uh, Chuck Hagel is I was the first Shane Wald lecturer here at New York Law School. And as you'll see, it's getting better and better. Started with me, then Senator Kennedy, then Justice Breyer, and now the best of the four, Senator Hagel is here today. So we're getting better. We're improving this program each year, but it's extraordinary how this program is bringing the best people uh, in the nation here um, to uh, participate here at New York Law School. And the final reason I'm introducing Senator Hagel is that we have been friends for over 20 years. Now you've got to understand there is no public interest matchmaker in this nation better than Judge Jack Weinstein. That is one of Judge Weinstein's secret skills, bringing public interest people together to promote the public good. And it was Judge Weinstein who over 20 years ago hooked me up with Chuck Hagel, who was then at the Veterans Administration and is one of, and the judge will admit this, one of the secret reasons that the Agent Orange program worked. Because Senator Hagel, then Veterans Administrator Deputy Hagel, was our liaison with the Vietnam veterans community. And what Senator Hagel did in convincing Vietnam veterans to willingly participate in the program created by Judge Weinstein was a critical element of success. And whenever I hear all these things that Senator Hagel is doing for the good of the country, I remember pre-Senate days what he did in bringing those Vietnam veterans together, not as a lawyer, as a shrink, as a psychiatrist around the country, and he pulled it off. And I think that's one reason uh, we've managed to get Judge Weinstein here from his busy schedule in Brooklyn is because Senator Hagel is here. Just one other point, and I want to give Senator Hagel a full opportunity to really address this crowd. One other point. Um, this is bittersweet. Senator Hagel's leaving the Senate after two terms as Nebraska's senator. But anybody who understands the Federalist Papers and anybody who really knows what Hamilton and Madison were thinking when they wrote those papers go to those papers, they must have been thinking of somebody like Chuck Hagel when they said in the Federalist Papers, members of Congress will represent local 
factions, local community interests, local constituents. Senators, on the other hand, two from each state, not then elected by the people, senators will not simply represent local constituencies. They will have a national perspective. They will look not only at the constituency which they elected, which elected them, but which appointed them, but rather they will have a broader pervasive outlook. What is good for the nation? If there is any senator, any senator in the U.S. Senate that has sort of fulfilled what Hamilton and Madison were thinking, it is Chuck Hagel. He has represented, I do not in any way denigrate Nebraska and its wonderful electorate, but let's face it, Senator Hagel has represented the people of the United States, not just the senator from Nebraska. And, and it is most fitting, therefore, that we um, uh, honor Sidney and Sybil and the Shane Wall Lecture with remarks from Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska. Ken, uh, you are gracious, thoughtful. You exaggerate. But those of you who know Feinberg know that that's one of his most endearing qualities, is exaggeration. To uh, Dean Matasar, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to uh, participate uh, in an important event for not only your law school, but for the community and uh, for the country. And to you, my dear, thank you, Sybil, for all you continue to do, the contributions you make. And for your dear departed husband, we are grateful for the leadership that he provided over, over many years. And it is a testament to him, obviously, uh, that uh, you have been able to initiate this series and and sustain it, although I would take some exception with Feinberg's analysis. The standards have been lowered. Uh, there's no question. My brother Tom, who uh, is a law school professor at the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio, uh, thinks uh, uh, it is a uh, sin uh, and a national tragedy, really, to allow me near any institution of higher learning. Uh, he may go into cardiac arrest when he hears that I was at the law school here, but nonetheless, he's a younger brother, always been envious, and um, I, I've had to deal with that, uh, that tension over the years. And, uh, I actually made him what he is, and uh, you, uh, you know uh, his uh, then dean of the law school uh, very well, and I know I will uh, pass on your regards. Jack Weinstein, thank you. I uh, am uh, grateful that uh, you would take some time out from dispensing justice. As I noted to the judge, uh, the rest of us just deal uh, in abstractions when it comes to justice, but he actually dispenses it. He actually applies it. Uh, no one I admire more uh, for public service uh, as well as other qualities uh, than you, Judge Weinstein. And, uh, my relationship with you over these years has been a cherished one, and that has been due uh, to our friend Ken Feinberg. And as I was sitting here this afternoon thinking, uh, when we uh, began that Agent Orange process, which later then uh, Judge Weinstein sucked me into another boondoggle uh, called the Manville Trust, which uh, he told me one day, Hagel, you must come to New York and talk to me about going on the board of the Manville Trust. I said, I will. So I got on a plane, came, and uh, it was a very uh, clear, short, direct conversation, as conversations are with Judge Weinstein. And he said, I will put it to you straight, Chuck. Uh, I need someone who knows something about life, someone I can trust, and no attorneys would qualify. <laughs> so I, th I think that's what he said. I, 
Uh, so therefore, I need a Midwesterner with a business background that knows really what the hell's going on. So uh, I, uh, I took on uh, that project and been uh, much enriched as a result. And as I was sitting thinking uh, how those days in the early 80s and uh, tied together and uh, how uh, we find ourselves uh, today in the year 2007, uh, honoring a, a common purpose and an individual who did so much for the world. Uh, that is uh, the essence of public service. That is the essence of public interest. I don't know if I could say it any differently than to suggest that public interest is the soul of, of our society. Uh, it is the platform from which we reach to the stars. It, it is the base that we use to make a more just world. Uh, it is the one dynamic that sets us apart from other, every other nation on earth, every other society, in the history of man, really, uh, in that uh, putting the interests of others ahead of our own self-interest uh, is our purpose. If there was a vacuum that exists today in America that we must address that's more important than any other issue, it is that we must reconnect with that public interest. And we have somehow, for many reasons, lost a good deal of that. And as I was saying to these brilliant young students that you have who will shape the world uh, as they prepare themselves, uh, it is their charge, as it has been the charge of every generation, to make the world better. Uh, politics is about that. Uh, everything we do in our lives should be about that. It's not complicated. It is not an abstraction. Uh, it is a purpose. And we must reconnect uh, a common sense of purpose, not just in our governance, but in our society. Uh, we have been thrown off balance, uh, certainly by uh, what uh, happened in this city on September 11, 2001. We have not regained our, our footing as a society. Uh, there are other collisions in uh, our country and our society that have uh, had the same effect. And as we look at poll numbers today in our country, we, we essentially see a, a people, a strong, vibrant, imaginative, committed nation uh, that is disconnected from its leaders, that has lost confidence in its leaders and probably the most debilitating, it has lost the only currency that matters in life, and certainly in leadership, and that's trust. We have debased the one currency that makes the most impact, we, the leadership of the country, and that's trust. Now, we will regain that, uh, but it is no longer a, a domestic or national challenge that faces us, uh, because it is uh, improbable, impossible, to confine our interests to national interests. We uh, Americans, 300 million of us, uh, are now, now part of a global community of over 6 billion people. That global community is underpinned by a global economy. And a a sense of purpose, a vision about the world, how do we make the world better, uh, is the real challenge uh, ahead of us. And that's going to require reintroducing America to the world. When you examine the over six billion people that make up this global community, you uh, will readily conclude that it is a young world, 
Forty percent of the people on earth today are under the age of 19 years old. What does that mean? Well, that means, among other things, that the post-World War II generation of the world that was connected to America's purpose, our leadership, and had confidence in our leadership and trusted our purpose, they have now gone from the scene. And so we now have more than half, close to 75 percent, of the people on Earth today who were not alive during World War II, not alive after World War II when America, with its allies, forged a new structure for a world uh, that uh, was much debilitated, understanding that, uh, as Eisenhower and Truman and Marshall and other great leaders of our time, that if we were to avert the catastrophes that had befallen the world in the first half of the 20th century, the deadliest, the deadliest 50 years in the history of the world, we were going to have to do some things differently. And they did. They built coalitions of common interests. The United Nations was built. NATO was built. General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is now WTO. Dozens of multinational development banks, institutions, IMF, World Bank. And why was that? Why was that? It was because it was a coalition of a sense of purpose that the challenges that lie ahead for the world, just as the 21st century challenges that lie ahead for all of us, are not just relevant, indigenous to America, to the privileged nations, but to all people. And so we built these coalitions of common interests, and we built some parameters, some highways. We built some structures to trade within, some behavioral standards, some values. Uh, we didn't do that alone. We didn't impose that on anyone. We didn't send our armies to invade countries to assure that they would do it. We didn't have to. It was a moral clarity and a moral understanding and a moral authority that allowed us, with our allies, uh, to seize the moment of consensus and build a better world for all people. Uh, the great challenges that we have today are found in the regions of the world that were left behind. Those regions of the world that did not benefit from the great advances for mankind over the last 65 years. And we should not easily nor cavalierly gloss over those great advances for mankind over the last 65 years. Uh, if we want to isolate just on two that are rather significant, uh, we have kept the world from World War III. We have not allowed the nuclear genie out of the bottle. Uh, we have made astounding historic advances in every universe science, medicine. But when you look at the troubled areas today, begin with the Middle East, uh, much of Asia, Africa, much of Latin America, North Korea, uh, these are the people that have been given no opportunities, beginning with essentially no individual rights, no liberties, no opportunities. Over two billion people a day live in some form of abject poverty, and probably the most the most insidious and most challenging issue before us and most difficult to deal with is despair. Because when man was, uh, is without hope, when man is without dignity, not much else matters. And it's rather predictable what the consequences are going to be when man has no hope. Uh, I don't uh, necessarily connect terrorism with poverty. Bin Laden is a clear example of that is not a reality. But when there are no choices for people, uh, there are evil components of the world community that will use religion, it will use theories, abstractions uh, to entice, to prey upon, and to enlist those who live in that constant state of despair. Now, what does all that have to do with a law school? Uh, I think it has an awful lot to do 
not just with a law school, but the theme of the point of why you continue these lectures every year, public interest. Because the public interest here uh, is served and must be served well beyond the confines of your law school or your city or your state or our country. Uh, the public interest knows no boundaries. And if we are to successfully engage and negotiate and resolve uh, these great 21st century challenges that know no boundaries, then it's going to take a 21st century frame of reference that uh, we have yet to frame. And at the essence of that, at the core of that, is not just public interest and public service, but a consensus of purpose. And within that dynamic uh, comes the leaders, uh, comes the forging of a great nation to harness its energies uh, and its morality uh, and its rich tradition and its worthiness of a rich future. Uh, what you are doing here uh, as you mold and shape and prepare these young leaders uh, is especially important because if there is no other defining dynamic of who we are is that we are first and foremost a nation of laws, a nation of laws. And to protect the rights enshrined in the Constitution of the United States is our highest order. A nation must never trade liberty for security. We have confused that dictum over the last few years. Uh, we have been especially successful at being able to balance those two for over 200 years. We have protected the national security interests of this country. And no one would question that. But at the same time, we've protected the rights, the individual rights enshrined in the Constitution. And we must never give those rights up on the basis of any excuse or any threat or any fear uh, because we will regret it and we'll never get it back. Much of the debate in Congress, as you have noted, and some of you participated in this in the last few years, has been over things like the Patriot Act and FISA and wiretapping and all that goes into this great arc of security. And within that debate comes another challenge that you are preparing our next set of leaders for. And it's just as insidious a challenge. And each generation must push it back. And no generation has ever been without their efforts and focus in defending it. And that is the concentrations of power. Concentrations of power in a big government, in big business, I used to say big labor, but it's different today. I have substituted for big labor, big media. Concentrations of the media, those three concentrations of power, big business, big government, big media, is what we must also be mindful of. And the interests of those that don't always coincide with the interest of individual liberties, not that they are necessarily uh, in conflict, but often they are. Uh, Ken talked about Madison and Hamilton and those who wrote uh, most poignantly about virtues, values, and the underpinning and the foundation of our government. Uh, are worth rereading more than occasionally because we more than occasionally uh, come untethered from uh, an orientation that's so critical for a free people. Uh, we lose our bearing. Uh, our compass azimuth is conflicted or jumbled. And when we renew our commitment to these individual liberties, and we reread these documents, 
it not only refortifies us, but it refreshes us, enhances us, and especially for our young people to understand what they are inheriting and their responsibilities that are attached to that great inheritance, just as every generation represented in this room has, was given a far better world than the generation that preceded us. And it is our greatest responsibility to assure that that next generation inherits an even better world. Better not materialistically. We don't judge who we are on that basis. We don't judge the goodness of a society, the justice of a society, the fairness of a society based on material measurements. It comes with it. That's a choice, hopefully, that more people will have. But these are transformational times, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, these are times uh, that are absolutely going to shape the outcome of the next generation. As I said to the students today, the votes I cast in Washington every day, the things you do, our professors do, Judge Weinstein does on the bench, regardless of our jobs, they are not for today. They're not for this week. They're not for this year. The immediate things we deal with, you deal with them. But what we are about is the future, preparing for the future, inspiring our young people for the future, giving our young people something that is worthy of the Sydney, Shane Walds, and others who have gone before and have contributed so much, worthy of them, worthy of us, worthy of what we've been given and fought hard to preserve and enhance. Uh, that is really the essence of the challenges of the 21st century. And within that great arc of these great challenges, uh, I uh, am as confident today that we are up to those challenges as we have ever been. Uh, it is more complicated. It is more combustible. Uh, it is going to take uh, a wise navigation. Uh, but uh, we can do this. And uh, this may well be, when history is written of this time, uh, one of America's greatest, uh, greatest times, greatest challenges, greatest eras. And uh, obviously, politics plays a role in that because it is that process that, that selects our leaders, that select our policies, that forge a future for a country. But it is not disconnected from the obligations and responsibilities of its citizens, and hence the public interest uh, is now as important as it's ever been. Well, I am um, grateful for a chance to share some thoughts with you and congratulate you for what you continue to do and uh, as you shape and mold the future of our world with our students and what each of you contribute. Thank you. I say that not. Uh, as a United States Senator, I say it more as a father of uh, two teenagers. Those of you who have teenagers now or remember the good old days when you did have teenagers, uh, you know why in the hell I'm leaving the Senate. I, uh, as one of the great Teddy Roosevelt quotes, many of you uh, are familiar with it, uh, and it was noted, I think, in one of the papers today uh, when there was a story about presidential candidates' families and their children. And when Teddy Roosevelt said, well, I've got a choice. I can either manage Alice or manage the government. I can't do both. Uh, it isn't quite uh, that way with any of us, but um, uh, we need to pay attention to our children. We need to pay attention to our children. And that is all of our greatest responsibility. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, I'd be glad to respond to questions. Uh, Ken, Fe Ken Feinberg will take the, anything too difficult, complicated. Yes, ma'am. You are so inspiring. We thank you for speaking to us about the need for public service. I'm sure many of us today are wondering what was the equation for you in deciding not perhaps to fight the dictates of the Republican Party and to try and get the nomination in a party that may have been quite 
disparate from your own views. Why, if you're so interested in public service, did you not make that fight? Well, um, that's a rather direct question. <laughs> uh, first, I have always believed that you need not be uh, in elective office to shape and influence the outcome of the world, even a political party. Many times uh, uh, you are far freer and have uh, more influence on the outside. Uh, I also said when I ran that I thought 12 years was enough. I gave an interview after I was elected 11 years uh, ago. I didn't sign any pledges, uh, but uh, I said I thought 12 years was enough. For me, 12 years in the Senate is enough. It's been the highest honor privilege of my life. Uh, I've got 15 uh, months to go. I want to stay focused and committed and apply the same energy and enthusiasm as I have over the last 11 months, and I intend to do that. But I want to do some other things as well. If I would have made the decision to cross the line to go for a third term, uh, I'll be 62 years old when I uh, leave uh, the Senate after 12 years. I would have been 69 if I would uh, been elected to another term, which I have some reasonable confidence that I could have won that. Uh, and, and that period there, 62 to 69, is an important period. Um, I uh, am in good health and question about the state of my mind, but um, <laughs> God willing, I'll, I'll keep uh, in good health, uh, but I, I want to do other things, and I, I do not intend to divorce myself or disconnect myself from public service or public interest. I've always been involved in public service, and w w whether it was Judge Weinstein's uh, uh, efforts or Ken Feinberg's or, or my entire resume is about public service, uh, and I don't say that in any boastful way, it's just everybody in this room uh, is about public service. So um, if, if you can understand some of those reasons, and I decided not to run for president uh, because I, I didn't think as I added it all up, and I think these kind of decisions have to be comprehensive, I, I, at least that's the way I make them. Um, you frame up the factors. I don't think it was the right time for me. Um, it's not a matter of not having the courage to fight. I, I, I think my 61 years on, on earth is, is some testament that I'm not intimidated by many people except Judge Weinstein. But uh, the rest of them, uh, I don't really give a damn. But um, uh, I just thought that it just wasn't the right time, it wasn't the right way, it, it, there was another way to do this. Um, and and I, last point I'd make, and we're all the same here. You've got to do what your gut tells you to do and your heart tells you to do. And if you try to fight that, every, every decision I've made in my life that's been a bad decision uh, has, has, is when I've been, I've gone against my gut and my, my heart. And I'm getting old enough now to start figuring that out a little bit. And um, my life's been, been a very happy life. I've been very uh, privileged and fortunate in my life. And I've not made the kind of mistakes that have really been debilitating to me. And so I've been very lucky, a very lucky man. And I, I don't want uh, to break that now. And, and when I think I can, I can contribute more and offer more, and I do, and I will. I just won't do it in the Senate. Yes. Thank you all sharing. Thank you, Mr. Um, we will be missed. Um, but we will get a lot of work on that side. I had a very specific though for the for several months. Um, the appropriations bill will be coming to the Senate and the Congress. Is there any possibility to let the people be working back to that? Thank you. Just, just a very qu quick point of reference. The amendment she was referring to, the Webb Hagel amendment, is an amendment that Jim Webb and I wrote earlier this year that does a very simple thing. It just it, it says that our troops who are serving in combat zones, uh, specifically Iraq 
Afghanistan should be given the same amount of downtime when they come back as the amount of combat time they put in Iraq. So now we're talking about 15 month tours. Some kids are, are serving 18 months. Some kids are there 21 months, second and third. And I mean, I don't think that's outrageous. Uh, Secretary Gates said he agrees with it, the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But the fact of life is we don't have enough manpower. We're, we're ruining our force structure because of Iraq. And we're now understanding that. Uh, even the generals are saying we're going to have to make changes sometime this spring because our rate of redeployment in, in Iraq can't be sustained because we don't have the people, unless you're going to suit the Boy Scouts up on weekends to send them over. That's all that's left. And so. Um, I, I don't understand when I get told by the administration, well, we agree with you, Senator, and we think it's right, it's humane, it's decent, it's the basic uh, requirements, but we just can't do it. Well, then I say, well, how about a change in policy? Because we're going to be facing something else here, and it's in the arc of challenges I talked about, and it plays into your question. And by the way, the, the answer to your question is, I think there is a possibility that will come back, we can get it back, is that a nation of 300 million people is relying on 1 percent of its population to carry all the burden, make all the sacrifices. Uh, our active duty force structure uh, today in this country is about 3 million men and women. And, and some people say, well, but Senator, they're volunteers. That's true. That's true. But you better look beyond that because even volunteers, they're not going to continue to put up with this. Uh, we, we see the immense gaps in uh, people not coming back. And in the rank structures of lieutenant colonel, captain, senior NCOs, 15, 20,000 short for the year, you don't have an army. You don't have an army without captains and senior NCOs. You do not have an army. And uh, we've got to figure this out because we can't allow this democracy to become the kind of a government, the kind of society uh, where the British and the Europeans used to hire the Hessians and the Romans took on the Visigoths and the latest issue on the Blackwater is a good example uh, over our security details. We can't even provide security to our own people. Most Americans are quite shocked by this because we don't have the force structure. We don't have the people. So we, are, we essentially hire mercenary armies. That's what they are. And I don't blame them. It's our policy. They're being hired. They've got a company. Sure, I'll go do it. I, I, make a good, I make a good buck out of the deal. But they're mercenaries. They're not loyal to this country. They're not loyal to a code of honor, to honor duty country. They're, they're, they're not, by the way, even subject to the laws of the land that, that they're in. And so that's another part of this debate that, uh, that's going to play out. But I've strayed way beyond your question. But. Did someone? Yes, sir. Did you have a question? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, the reason is, is because we are so overextending and so overburdening our force structure. Our mission does not match our capability, quite simply. Uh, you, you cannot take these people. In Iraq, we have about 170,000 troops in Iraq today. And many of these, these people are on their second and third tours, and now they're 15 month tours. Some are there 18 months, some are there 21 months, based on something American people are not familiar with, most of them, called a stop gap measure. And so you're supposed to be out. You're done with your tour, not only in Iraq, uh, but out of the Army. The Secretary of Defense has power to sign a piece of paper. It's called stop gap. We cannot let you go, I'm sorry, until I tell you you can go because your MOS, uh, that's your specialty, is too valuable at a time of war. Now, are we in a time of war? Congress hasn't declared war. Uh, that's another legal issue, but it's more than legal. Uh, so we've overstretched, overburdened, we're breaking our force structure, and it comes down simply to we don't have the manpower. Our missions now include about 140 countries around the world where we have some American force structure. Now, some are very small. Uh, we, we have about 30,000 troops in Afghanistan, about 170,000 in Iraq. The support force for that is astounding. I don't know how many of you have been to Kuwait lately, but if you take a look at Kuwait, 
the last time I saw military buildups like that was the biggest in the world, the, probably the history of mankind, was a place called Long Bend, Vietnam. And um, it, it takes huge sums of manpower logistically to support 170,000 people. And it's an occupation force. Uh, our army was not built for an occupation force in the 21st century. I mean, it, that's just the way it is. And I recall uh, Senator Jack Reed from Rhode Island and I introduced legislation five years ago to increase our army and increase our Marines. And I remember we were almost laughed out of our caucuses and off the floor of the Senate because they said, well, what do you need all those people for? I said, well, you, you can't do what you're intending to do without those people. And of course, that gets us into the whole issue of we never had enough men going into Iraq and so on and so on and so on. But that's essentially the reason we're in so much trouble. And it's going to take us a generation to come back out of this because you don't just invent soldiers. You, many of you who've been in the military, uh, some of you were in Vietnam or the Vietnam era, you know, when we had a draft. I mean, you're, you're a soldier, boy, and they'd send you away in basic and AIT, give you a rifle, and that was it, and send you to wherever you're going. That, that world's different today. The technology, the sophistication, the structure of an all voluntary service, and the investment we put in each person that we bring into the service is worth the investment. But, but this is a pretty high tech business now. And the consequence, too, and you might have noted uh, Secretary Gates's point about he's authorized an increase uh, ahead of schedule of tens of thousands of more Army two years ahead of schedule. And he said at the same time, in a letter to the Chief of Staff of the Army and Secretary of the Army, uh, that you cannot do this by continuing to define down the standards of the quality of the people you're bringing in. For example, the all-voluntary Army, which I support, supported strongly at the time and still do, uh, brought in new standards. If you're going to be a professional soldier, then uh, we want an individual with some qualities. What did that mean? High school education or equivalent, no criminal record, no drug record, so on and so on and so on. Because of our manpower problems the last three years, we've dropped all those standards. We are taking criminal records now. We are taking drug abuse records now. We're taking non-high school diploma people now. And now, the washout rate of that, of that group of people, we, we already know, uh, just from the last two years, is about 70%. I don't think anybody's shocked at that. Uh, I, this is not about... This is not about social redemption. If a, if a kid makes a mistake, getting caught with marijuana or a drug or drinking or whatever, listen, we're a country of sinners. We're a country of redemption. And, and, and every, everybody ought to have uh, an opportunity to come back and get straight. But that's not the kind of army we run. We don't run, this is not a social outfit. And an army is there for a very clear reason. And that's to protect the national security of our country and do it efficiently and effectively. And uh, we're ruining that. And there's a culture here that comes with that uh, as well. Guys like Colin Powell and Norm Schwarzkopf and others who came back from Vietnam after two tours, when most all our good people were leaving, many of you remember this, said, I'm not, I don't want this mess. And it was a mess in those days. It was a mess. It was, it was as racist. It, we, we had all kinds of problems. And, um, these guys stayed, Powell and Schwarzkopf, and stayed and rebuilt an army. It took them 30 years to rebuild the, the, the best fighting force in the history of man, best led, best equipped, best educated, and who believed in values. So uh, that's what's happening. That's what we're going to have to rebuild. Thank you.